Oh yeah, I should probably. <laughs> It's not allowing me to record to my um, hard drive. The record button in Zoom? Right. It's just that it's already recording. Yeah, I, you can't do that. I think uh, if you have uh, Audacity or something like that, you can record mm -hmm. that, though. That may be the best uh, solution. Good to have a backup just in case the uh, cloud video doesn't work. Yeah. Uh, or just to get a better yeah. audio quality. Yeah, I didn't realize. Do, 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 do. Welcome to our earliest attendees. We'll get started in a few minutes. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. Um. Hold on a second. Oh, wow. All right. We'll give uh, uh, go about a minute after the start time just to give people a chance to uh, get in if uh, any of the last sessions were running a little over. Perfect. And I will just um, start my screen sharing. No, I can wait till you're finished with the intro. Well, no. I'll just start it anyway. And then I can. And then I'll mute myself while you talk. Give just another few seconds uh, for people to come in and then we'll get going. All right, everyone, uh, welcome to the, I believe, fourth and final morning session of Intelligent Speech. Uh, you guys probably know the drill by now. Uh, you can leave your, uh, any questions you have in the uh, chat or click the raise hand button, although no one has done that all day in any of the rooms I've been in. Uh, so without further ado, uh, I will, uh, my, my name is David Montgomery, by the way, I'm the host of the SIEC Club podcast. I'll be moderating uh, this, uh, this panel. Uh, haven't had to ban anyone yet, so let's uh, see if we can keep that streak going. Uh, in the meantime, I will uh, turn it over to your presenter, uh, Tara Tixavala. Uh, take it away. You are still muted. Hey, guys. Um, 
This is Sarah Tungsalvala of the Rejects and Revolutionaries podcast. I hope you've been enjoying today so far and welcome to my intelligent speech presentation. Uh, today, I will be talking about what happens after crossing, which is looking at um, the earliest American history through the lens of 20th century research on the, on the logistics of settling in unfamiliar territory. The reason I'm doing this is that in 2022, we're still repeating 400 year old interpretations of the struggles at Jamestown and early American settlements. And I just think it's well past time to rethink that. Um, and in the 1970s, they did research that helps us do that. Uh, at that point in time, they were looking at best practices for organizing a successful settlement in an unfamiliar location. Because at that time, um, people in developing countries like Malaysia were setting up farming communities in previously sort of wild, uninhabited areas. And those communities really weren't doing well. In fact, they were going through a lot of the same struggles that early American colonists did. So um, researchers funded by the US government and other international agencies um, went through and analyzed why that was happening and how to minimize it, but then no one actually went back and used that research to apply it to the history um, and our understanding of early America. So there is one academic doing that today, and her name is Karen Ordahl Cook Cooperman, so um, shout out to her because her work actually pointed me to the exact study that I'm going to be using today. Um, which was a 1984 study funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, and to start with, as we are uh, addressing some uh, commonly held historical beliefs, I'm going to start by telling you what some of those are in case you don't like know. Um, as you can see, these two quotes were pulled from books which were published just a couple of years apart and both of which were very popular um, books in the field. So for the pilgrims, they say, they were weavers, wool carters, tailors, shoemakers, and printers with almost no relevant experience when it came to, to carving a settlement out of the American wilderness. And yet, because of the extraordinary spiritual connection that they had developed as exiles in Leiden and even before, they were prepared for whatever lay ahead. And on the other hand, the Jamestown quote says that despite the abundant timber and fish and the need to plant crops, it was the allure of finding gold that most excited settlers and investors back in London. While some colonists fished and traded with the Indians, too many others searched futilely for the precious ore, and they quarreled and conspired incessantly, anything to avoid work. Within a year, Virginia was on the point of collapse. And then this one has the same sentiment, a motley assortment of inept and indolent English gentlemen who came looking for easy money and instead found self-inflicted catastrophe. Without a trace of foresight or enterprise, they wandered about, looking over the country and dreaming of gold mines. They did not have the gumption, idlers. They did not have enough enterprise to collect firewood for the winter. Long before the cold weather was over, they were tearing down houses to use the wood for fuel. So you get the idea. Um, but at the point, I think, when you're accusing people of burning down their own houses rather than <laughs> chopping trees, I think you have to step, sort of take a step back. My strongest historical philosophy is that people are people, nothing more, nothing less. And when history discusses behavior that so flies in the face of reason, you have to ask not why the person was like that, but why somebody no fundamentally different from you or I would behave that way. And that is what this research il illuminates. Um, and as we discuss the research, I'm actually going to invite you to think about the unfamiliar location that we as a society think most about settling in the modern day, which is Mars. Colonizing Mars is actually the best analogy we have 
to what it was like to cross the Atlantic in the 17th century. Um, so it's just something to think about in order to bring this discussion into the present day and a present, present day relevance. Uh, I was gonna discuss it a lot more directly, but I just couldn't fit it in the time of this presentation. So, you know, who do you think would go? How would we recruit them? Who would run it? Who would fund it? What challenges would they face? Um, stuff like that. The most, uh oh. The most fundamental thing to understand and the most fundamental message of this research is that settling in an unfamiliar location is the most overwhelmingly stressful thing that settlers are likely to ever go through. It's a simple fact, but it's often overlooked. In the best case scenario, these people are completely cut off from home in a place where everyone else is in the same situation. So there's no stability whatsoever. No rules have been established. No, no one knows what they're doing. Everything is new. There's no established way things work or way that disagreements are commonly settled. And all of this is inevitably happening in a context where things are failing more than they're succeeding even in the best of times. Um, every day is unpredictable, best case scenario. It's overwhelming and human beings have a set standard, uh, have a standard set of re reactions to and symptoms of stress, like not doing anything, having frequent arguments, Decreased efficiency in job performance, depression, apathy, feelings of hopelessness. And you can see a lot of those reactions playing out um, in Jamestown, just in the um, just in the quotes that we discussed. Uh, and they were often listed as character defects of the Jamestown colonists. And secondly, you can also imagine how these reactions would turn a best case scenario into a worst case one in the context of colonization, because the fundamental paradox of early settlements is that there's a set, thing, a set of things that people have to do to survive, and the fact that they are going to be too overwhelmed to do them at least some, at least, you know, at some point. Uh, these are competing forces, and if you don't minimize the stress by any means necessary, it will win every time. And even minimized, there's a limited amount of time that settlers can remain stressed without things going catastrophically wrong. So that's the key. Everything you do and everything you plan has to revolve around this fact. Um, <clears throat> so the research shows that every settlement in an unfamiliar location goes through four phases. There's planning, transition, development, and incorporation. Planning is what happens before you go. Transition is the first rocky years which are characterized by this stress. Development is when the stress subsides and people start to actually come out of their shells and take risks. And incorporation is when a settlement is actually stable enough to not only run itself, but to hand the reins over to the next generation. So each phase has challenges and markers of likely success or failure, and they all point back to that key need of minimizing the stress of the transition phase. Um, so the first step is planning. And it seems obvious that making a solid research-based yet feasible, simple to execute plan um, would be the thing to do. You should learn about the climate, the surroundings, the plants that grow well, how to get good water, what industries might be viable in the long term, and then use that information to create a plan which starts simple and progresses logically toward a diversified economy with both agriculture and industry. Um, and that would be plan A, but you'd also have some backup plans in case various things happened. And yeah, like I said, logical, but also way easier said than done. Transportation to new areas is expensive. And especially in places like Virginia, or for that matter, Australia, or Mars could be cost prohibitive. Uh, new England was explored from Virginia, but early on, it was always a choice between going in blind-ish 
um, and not doing this at all. So in that environment, settlers learn a lot of simple things the hard way. In Jamestown, they found out that the winters were colder than in England, the summers were hotter, malaria was a thing, crops didn't grow the same, and oh, they didn't actually know where the clean water was, so they didn't settle near it. Um, it was all the things that you might not have thought to ask or they might not have been able to get the information about, um, but it was gaps in knowledge that could cripple an economy, uh, could cripple a colony. In Australia, similarly, the first colonists learned that their tools weren't strong enough to actually chop the trees that were um, in Australia. And the funniest story of a lack of research um, to me happened in Providence Island, which was England's first Caribbean colony. Um, there, their staple crop was potatoes, so they actually had something to eat but potatoes were kind of new to them. So they didn't know how to cook them or how long to cook them or what they were supposed to taste like when they were cooked. So they didn't know what they were aiming for. And they definitely ended up eating raw potatoes as their main staple of their diet, which is kind of terrible. Um, so yeah, and then recruitment wise, again, it's easier said than done. The research showed that ideally you would have thousands of people going to the settlement early on um, and that they would go in family units because this quantity of people facilitated security as well as the faster development of agriculture, towns, and industry. And as backward as it sounds, they also said that you needed to have um, a very homogenous group of people because in that sort of high pressure environment, the, so any pre-existing divisions were gonna cause really massive conflicts. So you wanted to minimize those and you wanted people to be as familiar as possible with each other before they actually went. Um, and so, you know, and then sending people and families was the most important thing of all. This particular study showed that people sent alone could only last one year without their families before morale collapsed. Um, and then this actually uh, connects to other research that's been done on the psychological effects of living in space or research stations in the Arctic and Antarctic. Um, because people in, because even though people in these places are specifically screened for predisposition to mental illness, they're able to communicate with their homes, they're um, they know when they're going to be able to join, rejoin civilization. And so like they have everything going for them. And even in those cases, it takes six weeks before people start to really be crippled by stress. And they have, you know, depression, anxiety, emotional swings, emotional hibernation, and even the increased risk of substance abuse on their return after just six weeks. So when you're talking about settlements and people being there in the long term, it's like the highest priority thing to get them connected to their families and to families as soon as possible, because otherwise things just don't work. Um, but again, that was easier. All of that was easier said than done in early America. Quantities, the logistics of sending thousands of people was not feasible in most cases. Um, that required dozens of ships, um, each of which had would cost hundreds of pounds in the money of the day. Um, and I mean, just think of the logistics of sending thousands of people to Mars over the course of a couple of years. Um, and could you even get thousands of families who were prepared to sort of um, go to the complete unknown? Uh, Virginia especially ended up having to recruit whoever it could get. Some people were there because they wanted adventure, but mostly they were there because they had nowhere else to go, whether they were debtors or delinquents or religious dissidents. These people had nothing in common. They came from all over the place. They fell on opposing sides of every major division of the time period, class, politics, religion. They were... Um, and just as the study suggested, this, me this meant that the minute that tensions arised, the entire settlement fell apart and people fought with each other 
sort of constantly and it became famous for that. Um, and then these people weren't families. And in fact, in Virginia, it was kind of unique in the fact that they didn't recruit families for almost a century. Um, for, you know, if for 40 years, for 50 years, they were still a seven to one ratio of men to women. And for the rest of the 17th century, it was still a three to one ratio. And the colony struggled because of this, because that tension was insurmountable. And then compare that with New England, where, um, where the migration actually fit the patterns endorsed by the research for the most part. They did migrate by the thousands, at least after the Plymouth settlement. And they were in families and in fact, entire sort of communities, entire congregations would move to the new world. And they named their towns after their towns from England in most cases. Um, but at the same time, New England became pretty notorious for its intolerance toward various groups of people. The pilgrims had the strangers, the um, Massachusetts kicked uh, various, groups, um, various groups of people out for either being too conservative or too radical. Uh, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and New Haven all split off from Massachusetts because of relatively minor disagreements. Um, they kicked out individual people who they didn't like. And um, obviously they had the whole Quaker and witch things, which are both remembered to this day. And that's not to sort of exonerate or justify them of this behavior, but in the context of knowing that the research shows that in these settlements, existing social divisions just get blown way out of proportion because of the tension, you can sort of start to see that maybe it was a little bit more human. Um, than, than just, than it initially sounds, I would say. Um, so yeah, we can already start to see the way that the various colonies were starting to differ significantly, even just in terms of their original planning. Even just what happened from England started to change the fates of the way that these settlements went. And it wasn't a matter of different people going different places, but really, organization and um, expectations. Um, and then obviously when you get to the actual process of settling that intensely stressful time period, well, I mean, we've all been through a couple of rough years and it's clearly affected us. The stress of being um, cut off from everything, trying to survive and build a community from scratch with no light at the end of the tunnel can't be overstated. Like I said, um, the research showed that in this, in this sort of situation, people do two things and two things alone. They grow food and they try to recreate their old, their old life. That's it. Not just for a couple of months, but for an average of five to 10 years after moving. If old farming techniques don't work when they first move to a new environment, settlers just continue to use those farming techniques anyway. And if they absolutely have to change anything, they do it as slowly as humanly possible. Um, we can see that down to the level of place names in New England. So we know that the Jamestown settlers uh, uh, it, we can see that down to the level of place names in New England. And we know where the Jamestown settlers were from, in part because their Virginia homes were attempted replicas of their English ones. Um, and even years after Barbados got fabulously, fabulously wealthy, they still continued to live in the same huts that they had originally built, just because they wanted that sense of familiarity and continuity. And the Real problem is that if settlers are pushed to do anything but just survive and replicate their old life in this time period, and this time period being a decade, they quickly become overwhelmed and that leads colonies to fail almost every time. Um, but the flip side of that is that sending thousands of people isn't cheap, neither is supporting the settlement, 
for the better part of a decade. And home govern governments and organizations are rarely prepared to or even able to take on this kind of expense for this time of kind of time frame without getting something back. And that puts the accusation of Virginians being gold seeking into a different light. Because when the Virginia company didn't get its money, and it was vastly in debt from having organized this in the first place, it accused colonists of laziness in the documents which continue to shape our um, perception of the colony today. And it demanded that they find something valuable enough to pay the settlers expenses. Um, and that meant gold. And they tried timber and that wasn't enough. So the people who were really desperately searching for gold were the people who were on the receiving end of the messages saying, hey, you gotta shape up. Um, and so, and then to add to that, the Virginia company didn't send them food. They sent them with 15 weeks total of food when they first arrived, which wasn't even enough for crops to grow under ideal conditions. Um, and, you know, and then that just sort of became a chronic issue, um, in Virginia history. Um, and the tricky thing is that this phase, this transition phase only ends um, once stress decreases and settlers feel comfortable enough in their new environment to start taking risks. There's no forcing it. And if you try to force it, you will sort of destroy a colony more often than not. Um, and a lot of colonies did fail for this reason in early American history. Um, and then, you know, and really all of these factors that we've been discussing become the, um, the sort of deciding factor between whether a settlement failed or whether it succeeded, um, whether it, and it, it's just whether or not they adhered to the best practices of this 1984 research, which is what the research said is like, you know, so um, it's not really surprising that Virginia stayed in limbo. Every, in addition to everything that we've discussed so far, colonists were almost actively prevented from leaving this phase. Frequent leadership changes were imposed from England and they didn't stabilize until 1640. Uh, merchant, merchant monopolies in England kept tobacco prices low enough that settlers were forced to operate at a subsistence level for almost a century. And when colonists went and explained that they needed to be able to trade outside the monopoly in order to make money so that they could invest and diverse their, uh, diversify their economy, um, their pleas went ignored. So like I said, the gender ratio also remained heavily, heavily skewed. And with everything combined, Virginia experienced a mortality rate of 40% within the first two years of arrival for several decades. Um, and then Barbados is kind of an interesting story because it was on Virginia's path. It was very much on Virginia's path um, until the Dutch artificially put them on a healthier one. After 10 years of struggling and having their own starving time and settler divisions and just an absolute disaster of a, con of a colony, um, the Dutch came in and retroactively fulfilled every criteria for success of a colony um, for the first two phases. They taught the colonists how to grow and process sugar. They taught them about the local environment. They gave them all the tools and all the labor they need they needed to um, invest in agriculture and diversify their economy. And suddenly within like four years, Barbados had gone from being Virginia 2.0 to the wealthiest colony in, uh, in the English speaking world. And also one of its more functional ones, by the way, it managed to avoid, it managed to avoid conflict better than any other colony did during the English Civil War era. But New England became the textbook sort of case of what should happen. Um, they had everything sort of set up right. They didn't even probably know that they did this, but they had everything set up right. 
some of it by accident. They had the knowledge of the environment, thanks to the pilgrims arrival 10 years before. They had the quantity of people, the family and community structure, everything. And um, even, you know, Virginia had even managed to send to send them corn a couple of times when they were struggling. So that was an added layer of security. And within five years of founding Massachusetts, they had um, they had moved on to phase three and they had gone through in order, uh, in the very order that the research identified, they had gone through the exact process of turning this sort of initial struggling settlement into a very robust one. They first invested in education, then additional agricultural ventures, then home-based business, and then town-based enterprise like transportation for hire, which, um, sh which shipbuilding actually became their um, thing that they were most known for for the rest of the colonial era, uh, shipbuilding and trading. And so, you know, after all of this, the fourth stage is the settlement assuming some kind of autonomy in running its own affairs. This is interesting to me in the context of the Revolutionary War because the research very clearly showed that to keep a settlement healthy, it needed to sort of take on the responsibility and the autonomy to sort of run itself. And initially these early American settlements did just that. Every single one of them, um, from Virginia to New England to the Caribbean, all of them. And then suddenly that was sort of taken away as the British Empire started to sort of evolve. And so there were the policies like the Navigation Acts and the imposition of royal governors. And that obviously, those are obviously remembered because they did lead to the Revolutionary War. And so it might be a stretch to put the Revolutionary War in the context of these four phases of colonization. But at the same time, it is an interesting thought that like that everything had been sort of set up for that so many years before. Um, and yeah, that's that that brings us to the end of my presentation, which I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, and I hope it's given you a sort of a new way to look at the differing struggles and fates and reputations of America's first like two oldest regions. Um, and even if it doesn't, doesn't sort of exonerate all of the behaviors and all of the things that went on back then, I hope it at least humanizes the colonists by showing that they were exhibiting the normal reactions of normal people to wildly abnormal circumstances. And on that note, I will open it up for questions. Yes, excellent. We've already got uh, one or two questions in. Uh, feel free to drop uh, other questions in the chat or press the raise hand button. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is uh, uh, really helped bolstering my uh, pride in my uh, Massachusetts Bay uh, ancestors. <laughs> uh, seem to be on a different level of confidence than uh, all their other peers. Well, you know, I mean, a lot of it was very, um, you know, they went for political reasons and religious reasons, and that really, um, that caused them to keep that community structure, which was the key. Uh, Robert asks, uh, weren't the Roanoke and Jamestown expeditions meant to find gold and silver to subsidize England's military and the struggles with Spain and France? I mean, that was the, the area itself. That was the hope. And that was a hope that was pushed mainly from England, less so from America, like, you know, but some people definitely, um, definitely were there to try to do that. But it was—it's a little overblown in the context of what the colonists wanted, and it's very much um, appropriately sort of given the appropriate um, priority within the context of um, English colonization and what the English wanted from it. I, uh, it see, I, I, over the years I've seen like lots of different. Uh, uh, answers top put out for like you know why certain colonies succeeded, why others failed or struggled. Uh, everything from uh, you know geographical determinism, uh, you, you settle in the right spot, to, cult to cultural determinism, you uh, you know the right values. It seems like you're really coming down on sort of organizational differences as as being the determining factor. Yeah, and um, personally, like culturally, like 
yes, there were some differences, but there were plenty of Puritans who, especially in the rough early years, there were plenty of Puritans who went to Virginia, you know, and the geographic thing, you could argue that, you know, you could argue either way on that. Um, I mean, but I really Boston think is it, a better place to be than uh, Plymouth if you uh, want to found a city. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And so I just think um, organizational. Yeah, I think that's a good way to put it. And I think that um, there's especially when you watch, like, I didn't read that much about um, these sort of Malaysian colonies that they were talking about, but um, when the, you watch them just centuries later and half a world away doing the exact same thing, it just sort of, I mean, to me, that's really compelling. And, um, you know, it's really compelling, yeah. <laughs> Are, are you able to offer any comparisons to non-English colonization efforts like Quebec or uh, uh, some of the Spanish uh, uh, attempts down in Florida or, or other places? The, um, no, the Spanish ones were a very sort of unique and I haven't really spent a lot of time uh, figuring out how they would fit into this scheme because they had a whole different sort of um, method. They had a whole different, you know, but I do know... Um, all of those, like every time you, you sort of read about the interactions between these English settlers and the French ones of Canada or the um, Dutch or the Swedes, there's always this reference to the fact that they're going through the same stuff. And I can't like name off the top of my head all of those, like any of those stories really, but it's always like, oh yeah, you know, that's it all fits within the same sort of uh, thing charlie asks uh you, you pretty clearly show that virginia was behind everyone else in the early colonial period uh, how do they catch up to the point where they were dominating uh one of the dominant colonies in the you know, period immediately before and after the revolution i mean a lot of it comes down to just i mean a lot of it comes down to just like sticking it out you know what i mean like eventually and this is this is kind of horrible but like you know eventually people have either died or they have gone on to sort of reproduce a more sort of um robust society with a more equal sort of gender ratio and um and you just sort of I mean it's just sort of just keeping going they had enough people in England at the time who needed somewhere to go that they had a steady stream of people who were willing to try their luck in Virginia. And the English Civil War really helped because it actually gave Virginia a dominant um, culture in the form of these sort of distressed cavaliers, these royalists who had lost the war and they'd lost everything and they were just looking for some place to go. Um, and Governor Berkeley really was instrumental in recruiting those people. And so you know, then you sort of had this foundation of a culture, you had this foundation of, um, they had tobacco, which was worth something if it was allowed to be worth something. And um, ultimately, you know, you just keep on keeping on and something will happen. <laughs> and that's what happened. To what degree did the, these, the lesson, these lessons learned from this first generation of American, British colonists mm -hmm. uh, affect, uh, or to what degree were those learned by the second later generations, you know, like the uh, uh, Phil, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, other other groups are coming in decades later. Where they have they learned some of these lessons to do, to do a better job by looking at what had worked and what hadn't? Or are they oh yeah, the same I mean things? even even Massachusetts and Plymouth benefited from Virginia because Virginia, the first place they went and um, explored was New England. And John Smith loved New England. He was like, "This is the place to go. This is the place to go." You know, and and so, and um, Squanto uh, spent time in England. So he was able to act as a cultural liaison. And so by the time you get to Pennsylvania or Carolina, <clears throat> sorry, um, these people are really, they're just, it's just a continual bu building on this information. Like those first Virginia settlements were just so completely in the unknown. And then, ultimately you just sort of add to that and you add to that and you add to that and then by the time you get to um 
Pennsylvania, it's the better part of a century later, and there's all these support potential places that can support a colony, um, like giving guidance, giving um, you know monetary support. Massachusetts was actually really good at giving monetary support to new settlements, and Virginia had given it to Massachusetts um, early on. And so, yeah, it really just the more you grow, the more little, the more balancing places there are to sort of help a new settlement. Uh, yeah, we've got time for one or two more questions if people want to get them in. Uh, okay, uh, Jay Moon asks, if you talk about the, uh, those who quote unquote went native, uh, uh, joining or, or, or adopting some of the, the customs of Native Americans. Oh yeah, that's, that's such an interesting thing. And I don't know if I can get in too much into it, but um, yeah, it was, there are two really big reasons that someone might go native back at the time. Uh, one was just the absolute struggles in that first Jamestown settlement. There were tons of people who did that. And some of them went and rejoined the English later, but a bunch of people uh, did do that. They went and they lived with the local tribes where people knew what to do and they could actually sort of involve themselves in um, in a sort of a functioning society. And um, there are a lot, there's some evidence and there are a lot of rumors and some evidence, I would say, that um, the, Roanoke, the Roanoke settlers did just that. And I actually tend to believe that at least some of them did um, because I do find that evidence to be compelling. And then there's also just people who did not fit in um, with the dominant society. And this happened a lot in Massachusetts where you know, if you find yourself on the sort of other side of that sort of homogenization of society that happens, well, um, one of the options was to go and go native. One of the options was, was to go live with the Dutch and plenty of people chose both. Oh, another option was to go to Virginia and actually a fair number of people chose that too, so. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sarah, for that uh, enlightening talk. Uh, we've reached the end of uh, the morning sessions, but uh, don't go away. There's a, a lunch keynote coming up uh, with uh, uh, people from the Ancient History Fangirl podcast and then into the afternoon, including uh, my talk at uh, 3.15 Eastern that I uh, need to finish preparing for. So uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Sarah, and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah, thanks for coming, everyone. I really appreciate it. So. And thanks, David, as well.